All right. Woo! While you guys are still taking your seats, tonight we're talking about purpose. The idea of like why we exist, why we were created, why we are here on this earth, what is our purpose, what is this all about? And in order to drive this point home, we are going to be in John 21 looking at a moment in Peter's life. And while you turn to John 21, I want to give you some background information on our main character, Peter. Peter is who I like to call an individual who acts first and thinks later, right? He's constantly showing up in really bold, big ways. Sometimes it's really good, other times not so great. Peter is the one when Jesus is asking the disciples, who do the people say that I am? Jesus is the one who says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, you're right, that's it. And on this confession, on these words, that is the rock upon which I will build my church, Peter. And then just a few moments later, Jesus is letting the disciples know that he is headed to Jerusalem to die. And Peter's like, never, I will never let that happen to you, Lord. And Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. It's like, ouch, okay. Like really high highs, really low lows. Peter, if you remember, was the only disciple when Jesus was out walking on the water, as one does, who's like, I want to do that. And Jesus is like, come on. And he does. And he's like taking some steps, act first, think later. He started thinking about what he was doing, and immediately he starts thinking. Peter is the one that when the people came into the garden to arrest Jesus before he was crucified, Peter is the one who struck out and cut off a man's ear. Yeah, you heard that right. I don't know what he learned that from. I don't know if this was like his warning shot. Like I'm just going to take off your ear. Don't like test me. But like Jesus is like, what are you doing? Like I already told you this was going to happen. And so guys, sometimes the Bible is just weird. Okay. Because in this moment, like this pivotal moment of Jesus's life, Peter's cutting off an ear. Jesus is like, don't do that. And he picks up the ear and like, Puts it back on the guy's face. What? And then he's like, go ahead and arrest me. What? It's just weird. Okay. But this was Peter. And this next story is the background information that we need for tonight's passage. It happened in the upper room. This was a place where Jesus had a meal with his closest friends. The night before he was betrayed and was going to be crucified. And Jesus is telling them what's going to happen. And Peter says to Jesus, I will die for you, Jesus. Like I'm with you till the end. Let me come with you. I'm ready to die. And Jesus responds to Peter. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Jesus is taken away, all of the disciples scatter, and we follow along with Peter and what he does. And he's in a group of people, and they point him out, like, you were with him. And he's like, I don't know the guy. Another group, like, you have to be one of those guys. And he's like, I never knew him. I don't know what you're talking about. And a third time, he says, I'm not one of them. And immediately a rooster crows. Peter realizes what he has done. That the very thing Jesus said would happen has happened. And he is broken. He's devastated. He is weeping and crying because he had done the one thing he thought he would never do. He denied even knowing Jesus. He denied the last few years he had spent following Jesus. And in that moment, I wonder if Peter thought it was all over for him. Like, how do you come back from that? 
can I lead others to this man that I just publicly rejected and denied knowing? How could he possibly use me ever again? And I wonder if you have a moment like that in your past or your recent history where you feel like you've, you've crossed the line and there's no coming back from this one. Like, sure, I've messed up before, and Jesus has helped me through this, but I don't think Jesus can even touch me now. How bad it is, what I've done. So John 21 starts out with Peter fishing. And this was Peter's job. It was his occupation before he ever got to know Jesus. And it was when he was fishing that Jesus called him into his purpose. I'm making you into a fisher of men. And isn't it interesting that when he got to a place where he thought there's no coming back, I cannot be forgiven for this, he goes back to what was comfortable, what was known. And I wonder if some of you can relate to that. Where you were adamant, like this, this thing, this temptation, this struggle, it's not going to get me. I'm going to overcome it. I'm stronger than this. And then you find out you're not. And then you just kind of have this moment of like, well, if this is who I am, this is who I am. And you kind of just give in. It's what you know. It's what others expect of you. And if people are going to think this way about you, they might as well make them right. And we just give in. I think this was Peter. He thought he was disqualified. He thought what he had done, there was no coming back from, so he just went back to what he knew. And the story happens that he's out in the boat with some of the other disciples, and they're fishing. And then there's this man on the shore and he calls out and asks hey have you caught anything and they're like no and he's like put the net on the other side and then they're like oh that's the lord he's done this before that's like total jesus talk right and so immediately as soon as they identify that it is the lord peter jumps out of the boat and starts swimming to the shore the boat is also headed to shore in my mind, this is how this plays out. Jesus, like, is on the shore. Peter's like, it's the Lord. He jumps out, starts swimming, and the boat passes him. Because a boat is faster than a human. And they're, like, rowing past and, like, I guess we'll see you when you get there, Peter. And then Peter, like, finally arrives to the shore. And he's like, <sighs> Jesus. I'm really, really happy to see you, Jesus. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Right? Here's what I find really interesting. There were two people who betrayed Jesus that night. It was Judas and it was Peter. And the way you respond when you know you have messed up largely determines what happens next. Judas was so ashamed by what he had done, he turned his back and walked away forever. He never came back. He believed the lies of who other people said that he was. He believed that he could not be forgiven, and he turned his back on Jesus. Peter betrayed him too. Peter was broken over it. He was devastated by it. But when Jesus showed up, Peter ran to him. How you respond in the midst of your disappointment, your failure, your screw up, your mess, dictates what happens next. So Jesus makes breakfast for them on the beach. And it says in verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. 
Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I think for some of us, when we've screwed up, when we've messed up, when we have failed, the voice that we hear in our head, the vision of God that we have towards us in the midst of our mess is a God who is shaming and condemning and disappointed and frustrated with us. Jesus could have said, hey, Peter, did you deny me? You did, didn't you? Did you deny me a second time, Peter? Yeah, I saw that too. Did you deny me even three times, Peter? Yeah, I heard it. That's not what he does. He's filled with grace and compassion. And I want you to catch this. He's saying, do you love me? He's giving Peter an opportunity to publicly state, I still love you. And he does it three times, which is significant because he knows that Peter denied him three times. And in front of the other disciples, the other disciples who were well aware of what Peter had done, who knew what Peter did, in front of all of them, Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Get back to your purpose. Get back to what I have called you to do. When he is saying, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Jesus is saying, I forgive you. It's done. I'm not condemning you. I am not shaming you. It is done. It is finished. Get back to the work that I have for you. Jesus forgives. He reinstates him publicly and he reminds him of his purpose. And it's the same purpose that we have been given to love God and to love people. It's really that simple. You and I were created, we were put on this earth to love God and to love people. So how do we do this? In the midst of our mess-ups, the failures, the screw-ups, how do we actually live this purpose out? How do we give ourselves to this very thing that we were created to do and to be? First thing, we actually need to believe that we've been forgiven. And it's not just... Believing that God forgives us. Some of us, we can intellectually get there. Like, I've read enough verses. I know your truth. Like, yes, I've said I'm sorry. And your job then, God, is to forgive me. But we also need to learn how to allow ourselves to be forgiven by others. Entering into those hard conversations and asking for forgiveness when we know that we have hurt or wounded. But perhaps the hardest level of forgiveness is learning to forgive ourselves. Right? Like, it's God's job to forgive us, so of course he's going to do that. And, and maybe other people are going to forgive me, but I can't forgive myself because I knew what I was doing and I did it anyway. I can't forgive myself because I hold myself to a higher standard and I let myself down and I cannot let it go because I've started to believe these things about me that I really am just this broken, this horrible, I can't get back because I cannot forgive myself. I wonder how many of you can relate to that. You see, the problem 
with not receiving forgiveness, the problem with not learning how to forgive yourselves and accept God's forgiveness for you is that your entire life, when you try to live out this purpose, you are going to be doing it from a place of striving, not a place of rest. You're going to be trying to do these things in an effort to please God. That maybe if I do enough good things, God will finally love me, finally forgive me. And maybe if I do enough good things, I can finally forgive myself. You were created to love God and to love others. And this purpose that he's put on your life, he wants to do it with you. He's not asking you to do it for him. He's already in love with you. He's already forgiven you. When we get to love God and love others from a place of rest, a place of acceptance, a place of love, the freedom that comes with that. I'm not doing this to earn or gain anything. It is the overflow of what God has done in my life. The way he has restored me, the way that he has loved me back into a place of acceptance and being known and being loved. So we need to receive forgiveness. But then we also need to learn how to stop comparing ourselves to others. How they live out this purpose. You see, as soon as Jesus reinstates Peter in front of all of the disciples and tells him, feed my sheep, feed my lamb, like go back and do the thing that I've created you to do. Immediately Peter's like, but what about this guy? What are you going to have him do? What's his life going to look like? Is it going to be easier than mine? Huh? Jesus? Jesus is like, it doesn't matter what I have for him. I've already told you what I have for you. Now go and do it. How often do we look at other people's lives from the outside and think if I just had their circumstances, it would be so much easier for me to love God and love others. Like you don't understand what is going on in my life, the things that I have to overcome. And it seems like it's so easy for everybody else. And let me just tell you, it's not. Everybody has stuff. And your hard might not look like my hard, but we've all got stuff that we have to overcome. We live in a broken world. But if I spend all my time comparing what my life looks like to what your life looks like, I get off course. I get distracted. I get frustrated. I get bitter. How he calls you to live out your purpose is as unique as there are people in this room. He has not called you to be anybody other than who he has made you to be. You are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared in advance for you to do. There are good works waiting to be done that have your name on it. That are just for you. Because of the way you're wired, because of your story, because of your background and your talents and your abilities, God has put these things out there for you. I went to college here, actually, and I trained to be a youth pastor. And that was like this unique way that I felt like God was calling me to live out my unique purpose. And I loved it. I did 10 years in youth ministry. I'm like, this is, this is it forever. I'm going to do this forever. And then the Lord was like, what about doing missions? And I was like, that's weird. I didn't study that. I don't know what that's about. But then he laid it on my heart and I went back to school and I got a degree in global leadership. And all of a sudden... I'm leading missions for my church, and I'm the teaching pastor at my church. Things I never would have imagined doing in high school or college. And yet, these were these doors opening that I just kept saying yes to. And then it was because I got that degree and I had this experience of being a missions pastor 
that CIY called. And they invited me to lead all of Engage. And so I relocated and moved to Missouri from California. Like, you know it is the Lord calling you when you willingly leave the beach for southwest Missouri. <laughs> yeah. And I did it. And I loved it. And it was incredible. And it was fulfilling. And yet, there was this piece of me that longed to be a mother. And when we finally got pregnant, I realized that the engaged job and traveling all around the world, doing these things that I love doing, it just wasn't feasible anymore. And so all of a sudden, I'm a stay-at-home mom with twin babies, still loving God and loving others. My purpose has never changed. The way I live it out has. And so it was because I was a stay-at-home mom that I was like, you know, it would be kind of nice to have a scheduled adult conversation time, just occasionally. And so Ozark Christian College invited me to be an adjunct professor to start teaching organizational leadership classes to students. I'm like, I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know if I'm going to like it. And before I taught my first class, I had a friend tell me, you need to go get your PhD. And I was like, <laughs> no. But then the more I did it, the more I loved it. And I'm like, if I'm going to be in higher ed, then I do need to get more education. And so then I started pursuing a PhD in leadership right here at Johnson. And it was me being here at a research summit. I know, it sounds exciting that the president approached me and said, we're looking for a campus minister, and we think it should be you. Nowhere, nowhere in my life plan, in my 5, 10, 15 year goals did I ever have in there coming back to Johnson University. And yet, saying yes, walking through the doors that have been opened for me, continually choosing to love God and love others despite the brokenness, despite what has been hard about it. Here I get to be loving this opportunity to now get to pour my life into college-age students, living on this campus, raising my four boys in this amazing community. I don't know what your life holds. I don't know what he's going to call you to. But your purpose doesn't change. We were created to love God and to love people. It's as simple as this. Jesus is asking you to follow just as you are. He is saying that you are worthy just as you are. He's reminding you tonight of something you may have forgotten, that you were created to love him and to love others. In a moment, Nate's going to come back out and he's going to give us an opportunity to respond. To say, yes, I want to take on this purpose. I want to commit myself. I want to recommit myself to saying, I want my life to be about loving God and loving others, regardless of the form that that takes. I want to say tonight, I want to be about his purpose for me. I want to live my life like this. And before you do what Nate tells you to do, what I've asked your leaders to do, if this is you, if this is you saying, I want to live out my purpose, they're going to give you a moment just like Jesus gave to Peter. And they're going to ask you a simple question. Do you love Jesus? And if you respond yes, then just as Jesus said to Peter, they're going to say to you, then feed his sheep. And I want you to hear in those words and in that moment, God's forgiveness for you. 
for all of it. Everything that has been done, everything that will be done, that in this moment you receive his complete forgiveness for you. But before we do that, I just want to address something. As someone who has been coming to CIYs for years with students, working with CIYs, that I know that there's at least two groups of people in the room right now. There's a group of you right now who is fighting that voice in your head that is saying you better not get up this year. You're such a hypocrite. You've been at these moments before. You've said yes before. But if you are honest, as soon as you left this space, it was back to normal. There hasn't been life change. Things haven't turned around for you. You get stuck in the same old patterns. And that voice is telling you to stay seated. Don't be a hypocrite this year. Don't even try. There's another group of you who are judging those hypocrites in your own group, who are well aware of the individuals who come every year, say all the right things that move, and go home and nothing changes. And you are sitting there right now feeling judgment, rejecting, recognizing within yourself that these people They don't mean it. They're not actually going to live this out. This isn't actually real for them. And I'm wondering if maybe tonight could be a night where we stop all of that. Where we stop feeling like what I've done is the one thing that the cross didn't cover. So I will continue to beat myself up and live in that shame. Maybe we stop that tonight. And recognize that the cross is for you too. And it is complete. And there is nothing you have done that eliminates you from the forgiveness of God. Nothing. And perhaps if you're somebody who has that person in your mind already and you're judging them and they're like, so help me if they get up and respond one more time and I don't see any life change, I'm going to be frustrated. Maybe tonight that stops. And maybe tonight you respond like Jesus would respond and you welcome them home with excitement. That it doesn't matter How many times we screw up. It doesn't matter. How many times we say I'm in and we fall down. And I'm in and we fall down. Jesus, every single time you take a step towards him, he is there for you. How dare we decide who is ready and who is not. You want to know why the world is frustrated with the church? Because we don't even know how to love each other. We don't even know how to support the very people we're called to be in community with. What would life look like if instead of judging that person for getting up and responding, you celebrated that decision, you believed the best of them, and then you asked, how can I support you so that this time it's different? What if that becomes our story? No one's disqualified. Everyone gets this forgiveness. Everyone gets an opportunity to say, yes, I want to live into this purpose. I want to make my life be about loving God and loving others. I'm done beating myself up. I'm receiving his forgiveness. I'm done comparing myself to others. And tonight I say it's a fresh start. Whatever the Lord has for me, I say yes. Because when I am living into his purpose, I know true rest. I know true joy. I know true love. Let's pray. So Jesus, as we have an opportunity to respond tonight, 
may the attitude in this room shift to one of opportunity, to one of love and acceptance. May the spirit of forgiveness fill this room for those who still believe, even now, that this is not for them. Holy Spirit, would you speak deeper than that lie? Would you replace those lies with your truth that you've seen it all? And you say you're forgiven. Lord, help us drop our judgments and our assumptions about one another. And as we say yes to your purpose, may we also be saying yes to loving the people in our own group. Deeply in the way that we say we want to love others. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.